have here today with me one of my very favorite guests, and that's the wonderful John Gray. Welcome, John. Happy to be here. So happy to have you here. You're so popular with my audience. And I was just sharing, uh, before we started to record, I was just sharing with John how much I admire and respect his work and the body of work that he has out there in the world. And one of the things that I also most respect about him is how he treats people. From the very first time I interviewed John, and I was really, really nervous because John was like this big, big interview for me, the biggest I'd ever had by far. Um, he has treated me, and I know he treats other people with dignity and respect. And so I just really appreciate who he is. And John, I want you to comment on that in a second, but I do want to make sure I just do a real quick, um, short intro. But it means a lot for you to contribute and to show up in the world that way. And so thank you. You're so welcome. So John Gray is the author of the most well-known and trusted relationship book of all times, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. USA Today listed his book as one of the top 10 most influential books of the last quarter century. In hardcover, it was the number one best-selling book of the 1990s. Dr. Gray's books are translated in approximately 45 languages in more than 100 countries and continues to be a bestseller. He's written over 20 books. His most recent book is Beyond Mars and Venus, Relationship Skills for Our Complex Modern World. And this book is fantastic. I'm reading through it now and I'm picking up so many gems. I was telling John that one of the things I love about interacting with him is there's so many gems and he can only share so many of them in one interview. So this is a place to go deeper. Um, his Mars Venus book series has changed the way men and women view their relationships. And you can go to marsvenus.com, which is John's main website at any time. And he's got a lot of really amazing resources and free gifts there too. We'll let John tell a little more about that later on, but um, I did want to mention that now. So John, thank you once again for who you are, for how you show up in the world, for how you treat people, and for the contribution you've made to my work and to my audience. My audience just loves you. They, they email me all the time. When's John going to be on again? When are you going to interview John again? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I was, you were sharing your feelings with me before the recording. So uh, you said, hold on, hold on. And I wanted to use your appreciation of me as an example for women. As you're acknowledging me, you're kind of saying underneath, you're this big famous guy, you don't have to treat me with such respect. And then I do. Uh, then you go, amazing, you don't have to do that. And you did that. See, that's actually the best. You feel good saying it. And I feel on top of the world hearing it because it's pure, uh, unconditional loving support. It says it's, it's, it's amazing experience. And I experienced that the first time in my marriage with Bonnie and Bonnie has passed three, four years ago. And, but we were married for 34 years. And I remember the first year of marriage, we got pregnant right away. And here was, uh, my wife is, uh, pregnant. Now I told her when I married her, I said, now, honey, I'm an amazing guy. Uh, I'll do anything you want. The only thing I don't want to do is wash dishes. I used to be a dishwasher, you know, and Whoa. when I was seven years old, my dad had me washing dishes for nine people in the family. So it was a, a bit of a trauma for me. And the truth is I've always felt like when I can actually enjoy washing dishes, I'll be enlightened. But anyway, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, then I was a spiritual monk and I was the personal assistant, the Maharishi and the TM movement. And I washed his dishes and cooked for him. So part of the time, so happy to do it because it was my big teacher at the time. So anyway, so I, I married Bonnie and I told her that. And she says, John, you're so amazing. If you don't want to wash dishes, you don't have to wash dishes. So I don't have to do it. And then she got pregnant. So I told her, honey, no washing dishes for you. I know you're pregnant. I will do all the dishwashing. And then after that, we'll go back to our original agreement. <laughs> OK, <laughs> no washing dishes. And I would wash the dishes. And she would sit there and watch me with so much love more love than any other way I felt it because she, in her mind, she was going, you know, John's washing the dishes and he doesn't have to see that's the feeling of sweetness in the beginning of a relationship in the dating part. You know, this person's doing this. They don't have to, they don't owe me anything. It's right. just not taking each other for granted. 
And an example of later in the marriage, nobody's perfect. We, we've gone through all these challenges ourselves. And I'm left with a million answers based upon the things that she taught me and I taught her together. So one day we're on a romantic date about seven years into the marriage and I walking through the doorway and I open the door for her. You know, I don't always open the door for her, but we're on a romantic date. You put on your romantic skills, you know, there's right get into the grind of life. You know, you're out there working in the field, you know, but then romance, you're going to put on my uh, attentiveness to her. So I'm opening the door and she's walking through, but it's a double door and a tall man, rather handsome man walks up on the left and I'm opening on the inside and he opens the door for her as well. So he's opening the door through these glass doors. Oh, I open the door and she smiles at the stranger and she says, oh, thank you. And I went, oh, I've heard that tone of voice a long time ago. (laughs) She says, oh, thank you. And then we walked off. Now, what I heard very clearly when she said, oh, thank you, it's Oh, thank you. You didn't have to do that. And what a gentleman you are. You did it for me. Now, John, he better do that because that's his job. And I do his laundry. So he owes me to see how that's called taking your partner for granted. Yeah. Now, I don't want to just lay this on women that they do that, but we have to be aware of how we take our partners for granted. We men also take our partners for granted by not doing the little things we did in the beginning. We think, well, now I'm doing the big stuff. You don't need me to do all these little things like hold your hand, give you compliments, be affectionate, foreplay and sex, you know, various basic things we did in the beginning. But men have a tendency to go, well, I've already done that. So why do I have to do it again? And mm-hmm. Or there's a fear that if I keep doing it, it won't be appreciated. So why bother? Because repetition does create a sense of, well, you should do that. And nobody wants to feel in a marriage that you should do that. It's Mm -hmm. like you did that. You didn't have to do that. Then it's like this free gift that you're giving someone as opposed to a business deal. And so that's this kind of love that I just wanted to point it out. This is what men hunger for is for a woman's appreciation from the perspective. And you didn't have to do that. And you did that for me. Makes you special. You feel special saying that because he did something that He also made you feel special by doing something. And my message is for men, do lots of little things that you don't, quote, have to do. And it always produces the hormones of happiness inside of a woman. And if you do a big thing, that's good. That produces hormones of happiness, but it goes away the next day. So so a lot of little things make the difference. And I I just want to share, share, Michelle, I know you got questions. Probably just going to answer some questions. But I've had a new insight of developing a course with uh, my daughter, Lauren. It's uh, oh, wonderful. Uh, we got another course coming out called Understanding Men. Oh, and wonderful. it's about how to get men to participate again. You see, automatically men are motivated in the beginning and then the motivation goes away. And women don't know that's inevitable and there's nothing wrong with him. And it doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Is the biggest misunderstanding women have towards men is that they'll always be motivated if he loves me. And the biggest misunderstanding men have about women, these aren't the biggest, these are some of the ones I talk about, but this focus is that men will think she will always be happy because in the beginning, she's so happy about things. It's so easy to please her. So he figures, wow, this is great. Now, when I give her, you know, monogamy, she'll really be happy, but still those little things that makes her happy. And also it's just simply moods. Everybody, women are like the weather is what I teach men. Never judge her for not being happy and don't take it personally. If you can understand that women are different in terms of this estrogen that has to cycle, estrogen goes up and it goes down, Uh, progesterone has to go up. And if she's busy working hard, her progesterone will be low, she'll get estrogen dominance, that will cause her to be more stressed out. Now, I know I said a lot there, you would understand all of that. That's not my lesson to teach today. That's in this book, Understanding Your Own Hormones as a Woman. But there's certain times when you need certain things and other times you don't. And if you look for those things at the wrong time, it doesn't work for you. So this is so interesting once we understand our hormonal differences. So so the bottom line here is how do men take women for granted is not doing all the little things we did to say, I love you. We just say, I assume you think I love you because Mm -hmm. I did this big thing. I married you. You should know. No, we have to do those things. And for women, there's this feeling when you start giving more than you're getting from a man, then you start feeling he owes me. You should do that. After all, look what I do for you. And when you catch yourself doing that, you go, "Uh uh-oh, formula for disaster. Mm -hmm. I'm out of balance. I've gone too far to my giving side and I'm not on my receptive side. 
So at that time, don't look to him to give you more because you've already trained him to give less. You see, mm. when you give more to a man, you're training him to give less. Just get that. That's just simple logic. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a gem, ladies, right there. Yeah, it's just if you give more than you're getting, you're actually training a man to give you less and less. You're rewarding him for doing less. Now, the reason that's not so apparent to women is that if I give more to my wife, she feels I have to do something for him. You know, when women, it's this, it's this quality of our feminine side is reciprocity. Okay, <laughs> if you do something for me, well, I should do something for you. Right. And that's like golden rule and all these things. And, but with men, the biology is such that if I do something, if, I, if you give me something, your love, your affection, your warmth, you make a meal for me, you say nice things to me, I assume I'm doing a good job. So I get to go on vacation for a while. And then you right. keep doing that. <laughs> I get some time off. <laughs> yeah, I get to, I, did, I did my job. Now I get my time off. And, and again, is it men to find their motivation? They need to pull away to restore balance in their hormones. But then they often, this is another course called Understanding Men that we finished. It's not yet public, but it's how to get a guy out of the cave. <laughs> but yeah. he's stuck in there. Because that's called addiction. You know, it, it, men taking time for themselves is very important to rebuild their testosterone, but there's certain types of cave time that will actually become addictive. Uh, just as for women, sharing feelings is actually very good to produce estrogen, but sharing feelings to change someone, that's called complaining, is actually addictive. You'll do, your brain will just go into a loop of always looking at things to complain about and you can't get out of it. You find, why am I so picky about this? What's going on with me? Why am I holding on to this? It's all hormonal imbalance. So, so basically, we want to become aware of the ways we feel our partner should do that if, they're, if they love me and start coming back to understanding, really, you can love someone and not be motivated. And my wife could be really loving towards me and not be happy. She's just unhappy about something else. Doesn't mean she doesn't love me. Well, and just being happy doesn't mean she doesn't love me or unhappy. It's learning how, when she's not happy, what can I do to get out of the way of making it worse? That's the most important skill for men, <laughs> how to keep up making it worse. <laughs> and then provide me. a comfort zone, a safe zone for her to find her happiness again, which is all kinds of, uh, one of the most powerful ways is be a good listener, learn how to ask questions, empathize, understand, and truly expand your awareness, which we can learn to do if we just have the logic for it. Okay, so I, I could go on and on and on as a whole course, but I know you have lots of questions from some of the other uh, talks I've given. So let's go for it. I do. I want to just uh, touch on a couple of things you said there, though. First of all, I love the analogy that women are like the weather, because I do think even if we're not in our monthly cycles, we are cyclical be cyclical beings in terms of our moods and in terms of our energy levels and in terms of our receptivity and things like that. And that tip for men to not take, not necessarily take it personally if a woman's going through <laughs> the weather patterns of her. Yeah, if cycle. you if you know that this is natural and it's passing, if it's a rainstorm, you get an umbrella and put on a jacket. If it's hot outside, you take off your shirt. You know, you just <laughs> if it's cold outside, you put on jackets. There's no such thing as experiencing uh, being too cold. It's just not having the right outfit. Uh, so men have to just adapt okay now this is what i need to do but anything i do to change her at that time will only make it worse you know you can't fight the weather mm -hmm. and then i know we could have a whole talk about this too but another thing that stands out for me is not creating like taking your partner for granted by having the nice things that they do become like expectations and then you just add 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 to that without appreciating what is already happening. Because I think that can happen in a marriage. I've been married now for 15 years, didn't get married till 43. So I spent a long time as a single woman and being real independent. And we can have these expectations and we can have, and we can start taking things for granted and we can keep building on that. Or we can expect that our partner just through osmosis is gonna know exactly what we want or need. Like yes. shortly after my husband and I got married, when we first got married, we had two homes, his home and my home. We used to joke and say, when one got dirty, we'll move to the other one. That's <laughs> not really what we did, but that was our joke. But at one point, the house we were living in, which happened to be my house at the time, was needing some cleaning. The bathrooms, the kitchens, everything needed a good cleaning. So I get up on one Saturday morning, John, and I'm like a house of fire. I am like cleaning. I'm like a cleaning maniac. And in my mind, I'm thinking, 
he's going to jump in and help me. I didn't ask him to help me, (laughs) but I thought he's going to see me going all around the house, doing all this cleaning with so much zeal. And he's going to want to jump in and help me. Well, guess what? (laughs) He just stayed out of my way. He's like, man, I don't know what's going on with her, but I'm I'm out. I'm out of the way here. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with her, but I like it. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm getting madder and madder and madder in my head. Right. I'm like thinking, he sees how hard I'm working. He sees what I'm doing here and he's not helping. Amazing. That was one of our Amazing. first meltdowns when I thought, oh, wow, maybe I have to actually communicate a little more. Yes, yes. That's so great. So great. Yeah. So these um, things also bring up a couple of um, of questions. This one kind of goes along with what we've been talking about. I thought this was kind of a sweet question. This woman says, when my partner does something and I show appreciation, he always tears up. Do you know what that is about? Is he just so full of joy? He's hyper masculine, by the way. So it's real cute. That's so beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? It's an acknowledgement of how important she is to him. Uh, I have to say, you know, I'm this very hardworking masculine guy, but also a very soft loving guy you know i've integrated the male and female side and it's through loving a woman that that happens for a man if a man just becomes soft without loving a woman he becomes soft (laughs) he should needs to be hard and she's soft you bring those two things together every man just wants a woman to appreciate him and love him for what he does for her what he provides for her and when you feel deep inside that maybe you're not worthy of it or you're not going to get it or it's not possible and you get it it's so sweet it's so sweet Yeah. And I don't know if we as women can really get and understand how much that means to a man when he receives that appreciation and acknowledgement and when he really receives that kind of feedback, because I think a man's experience, you know, sure, women are out there in the workplace that are, you know, kicking, kicking tail and taking names and all of that. But I think a man's experience interacting with other people is not the same like men i think they don't compliment each other as much they don't give each other that much positive feedback right we're competing with each other there's a competition there's a measuring of what you've got what i've got it's always being a measurement to see how powerful you are power is the key thing not a negative power to change other people that's insecure men but you want to measure yourself And you look for how you measure yourself as you look to, okay, I can do this. And what kind of a reaction do I get from that? And so it's confirmation that I'm good enough. It's an amazing thing. Part of all of romantic gestures that I recommend to men for women is do all these little things for her without her having to ask if you you can do that. And I teach them what to do so they know to do and if she doesn't ask. And what she's getting there is the reassurance again and again that I deserve to be loved. I don't have to do more to get loved. I don't have to do more to get love. And that's what happens when you have your strong, nurtured female side is you relax and you have a trusting that if you're not getting what you want now, you just shift gears, focus on some other place where you can get what you need. And then as you're feeling happier, you become like a flower and bloom and you magnetically pull out the best at him. But often you have to ask to get it. That's why we talked about in the beginning is that needing to realize you kind of brought it out, which is, you know, you're cleaning the house and he's just sitting there watching men have a gene, the motivation gene. And it says basically never do anything. You don't have to do. See, <laughs> we, we live in a world of have to that's testosterone. And when women are too far on their male side, their unhappiness comes from, I have to do, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do that. That's the sure tell sound uh, sign that you've gone too far to your male side as opposed to, I get to do this. I like doing this. I love doing this. I like having someone do for me. I have someone to do for me. I have so much in my life and the gratitude, the happiness, the excitement, the um, being proud of yourself, what a good person you are. All those are the qualities when you're in touch with your soul self, but you need support from the outer world. Men need to have their feeling of being uh, acknowledged for their competence, their capability, their support. That's the the big thing for men. Now, certainly I want all those things women want and women want all those things men want, but how much do we need? See, that's the secret to all this is to recognize that on the male side, it's the testosterone. Whenever you acknowledge what a man does with appreciation, that he made a difference, he's accepted and he's trusted. Those are the powerful messages 
that build a man's testosterone back up. And for women, the powerful message is to build her estrogen up is that you see her, you hear her, you consider her, you care about her, you touch her, you, you go into her both emotionally and mentally, then you go into her physically. And there's, that's the complete fulfillment. Mm. Yeah, really beautiful. So this man from this question, this man is tearing up because he's probably getting this from no one else in yeah. his life. There's yeah. probably no other source for it. And this woman in his life. Now, to know that there could be other people giving it to him, but they don't mean that much to him. The fact oh. that that's why I said he loves her so much that she got it uh, from that. He's getting it from her. Oh, uh, that's a good nuance. Yeah, that, that's where he really needs it from her. There, there's a place as a man. You're constantly measuring yourself. There's this thing about alpha males, right? There's yeah. every monkey tribe. And we're ruled by a lot of conditioning that comes from our monkey life. And, you know, that's our digestion and all kinds of hormones, as, as well as our sex drive. These are all things that are partially ruled by a primitive part of the brain, which is instincts. And when, when a woman is appreciating a man, particularly if a woman is responding to his romantic gestures, that means he's the alpha. You see, in the monkey kingdom, if you're the alpha, the head of the tribe, uh, the women all want to be with you. So... <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, there's a conscious message at the woman he cares about. Other people could appreciate him, but in his mind, he could be thinking that person is much better than me at this. And I can't be the number one. I'm not the best, which I always say to men. I say, if you want to help market your company, (laughs) always say that you're the you're the best at something like you're the best in California as opposed to other states. You know, for, for providing this, we are the very best men want to feel the best. And so if you can't compete with all the men in the world and nobody can, there's always this little thing that we're we competing and everybody competes, but men just do it more. Now, once women are on their male side, they also compete a lot. Right. And that causes low self-esteem when it comes to body image. How beautiful am I? That's your male side telling you you're not so beautiful because uh, you're out of balance. You are beautiful. That's who you are. It's to love yourself just the way you are now. And always to grow, nothing wrong with wanting to be better, but you don't have to feel I'm not enough to become better because it's the natural flow of life to become better. So the need to criticize people, punish people, push people down, actually that's very primitive. If you're a monkey that's and a low consciousness person, that's required. But once you get to the higher consciousness, we actually care about love and romance. It's a different set of rules that apply. Uh, You know, Baslow talked about what level of life you're at is survival level. Then all you need to be happy in a relationship is somebody can feed you or or you can build a fire. I remember once I was in an argument with my wife, Bonnie, and going to our ranch, we used to have a lot of fights in the beginning. We overcame all that and improved great sex as a result later on without the fights. But anyway, we're at, we're at our little place at our ranch that I got in, in Northern California, where it's really cold and winter not comparable to these coasts, of course, <laughs> but right. for us, it was gold, but it was an old place. And so it had thin windows. And it was really chilly. So we got there and there was sort of a tension between us and I built a fire. All the tension went away because we were cold and that was our primary need. And we got warmth. So when you're getting what you need, your heart can open. But when you're not facing survival and then comes security, then comes, belo- then comes achievement, then comes belonging, Uh, then comes intimacy. And that's a higher level of consciousness. So the more you can be independent, achieve, that you've got your group who supports you, then the key thing to growth that you feel a need for, just as important as the need for food and survival and security and money is the need for love. And that's where we are now, is that people who are discontent in their relationships is because they haven't identified that need and been able to explore it and get it. Women will feel when they're out of balance that they need to be appreciated. See, that's a, the number one complaint from an unhappy woman is I don't feel appreciated. And keep in mind that men are not good appreciators. That's why we're drawn to women. That's why there's, what is it, in football, there's guys out there <laughs> banging their heads, suffering, getting concussions, getting beat up in order to get the cheerleaders <laughs> <laughs> right. to raise, to raise their legs and wear cute dresses, you know? This right. Is, this, women are cheerleaders. They have that inside of them. Not that they can't go out and beat each other up, but generally speaking, most women go, is that really worth it? Right. A little bit <laughs> worth it there. But cheerleaders is that to be appreciated for what you do bumps their testosterone. And to be appreciated by your wife makes you the king. See, she has a bigger impact because why do men even seek to compete? It's to be the number one for her. 
And why do women open their heart and give so much is because they want to be treated special. You know, we all, a little distinction in the word, men want to feel important. Women want to feel special. And Mm -hmm. when you're over there looking like, where's the appreciation for me? What I suggest is you're looking in the wrong direction. And where you need to look at is don't look for appreciation, but look for respect. See, respect is different. So when my wife was feeling unappreciated, in the early years, she used to always say, and so many of my women clients say, I don't feel appreciated, I don't feel appreciated. And so I said, I gave my own experience, which I appreciated my wife so much. She, at the beginning, she cooked dinner. She never complained. She took care of the house. She was great in bed. I got everything I wanted. Are you kidding? You think I don't appreciate her? She's everything. Why doesn't she feel appreciated? Because feeling appreciated increases testosterone. And that's not what she needed. What she needed was estrogen. So I even went so far as to sit on the phone talking to my friend so she could hear and say, oh, Clifford, I'm just so lucky. My wife is the most amazing woman. She does this for me. She does this for me. She does this for me. (laughs) And and I appreciate. So imagine you've got this husband and he says to you, uh, I appreciate you so much, honey. I don't have to do anything. By the way, would you bring me the remote control? (laughs) You're really going to make her angry. Because what she really needs is not for him to ask her to do more for him, for her. She needs him to do more for her. That's what women are feeling neglected. And they think if if I'm appreciated, then I'll somehow feel happier or he'll behave better. No, you ask for what you want and he'll behave better and then reward him with appreciation and he will respect you more and his appreciation for you will grow. But first he has to respect you, do things for you, treat you in a way that makes you feel special, fulfills your needs. That's what respect is. Everybody thinks respect. They don't know the difference. Even in the dictionary, look up respect. It says appreciation. So, but they are two different worlds. It's when I respect someone, usually I will respect someone if I appreciate them. So if a woman doesn't feel respected, she thinks she's not being appreciated, but actually he is appreciating her. He's just, she's, he's just not respecting her. And he doesn't respect her because he doesn't understand women. You know, if you say, look, honey, I just need to talk about this. Don't say anything and I'll feel better. And if he does it, he's respecting your request. He's respecting your need. So when I drive, when I'm driving on the highway and if I respect the speed limit, what do I do? I slow down. See, right. I like to drive fast. I go 100 miles an hour. I drive to other places with no speed limits. So I can go 150. That's who I am. But when I'm driving here, I respect the speed limit. So I slow down for that. So that's called respect. It's altering you what you want for somebody else. And that's what romance is. See, romance is a man not doing what he wants to do, but finding out what she wants to do and delivering it. That's romance. And women have to get that. Giving to him is not romantic. He'll like it. Sure. Give me more. And right. he'll like that. But he doesn't like you more. He bonds when he succeeds in doing things that are of value to you. And that's called respect. Mm. Yeah, this is such a key. This is such a key piece right here, because I do think that there's a lot of women. Well, I know a lot of women have a tendency to want to overgive. And in the dating situation, they feel like that's going to draw a man closer or make him like her more. Doesn't usually have that kind of an effect. Um, he likes himself more. Yeah, he likes himself <laughs> more. And so if a woman is in a relationship where she has gotten into this pattern of, of overgiving and maybe she's feeling this, she's feeling like she's not appreciated and wants to move in the direction of bringing that back in balance or res- uh, experiencing what you're calling respect. How yes, does she what do- I'm calling respect. I've made that distinction because what I see is the downfall of relationships because in the Christian tradition, tremendously, it's a woman should ever all these Christian books and relationship books say, oh, women, men need respect. No, men need appreciation, acceptance and trust. That's what you're doing when you build a statue to them. That's what you're doing when you do things for them. Women need the respect. And the respect is, you know, that remember that move, that song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yeah. Uh, it was huge. Aretha, it was Aretha huge. Franklin. Aretha, Aretha. And so there isn't a distinction of respect. And my wife taught me that. She didn't feel respect. Once we got beyond the appreciation thing, then I was able to say, look, when I do things for you, when you have a need, when my child is crying in the night, a baby, I get up out of bed 
and hold that child. I don't want to. I don't want to get out of bed. It's not like, oh, she's crying again. I get to wake up and no, I don't want to do that, but I happily do it, you see, because I respect my child's needs. It's not like I appreciate my child for crying in the night. <laughs> it's right. I'm respecting. So respect has a lot to do with caring for others, understanding others, creating space for them. And in and, and a sense, all this hypersensitivity that we see in society right now, several reasons for it, but one of the reasons is people are getting in touch with their need respect. They're not, no one ultimately is respected when you get message that you deserve to be punished and you're bad. Unless you're an adult and you behave that poorly, you still don't need punishment. You need to be confined. You need to be separated from society and rehabilitated. But we don't need to punish anybody. The idea you need to hurt somebody to get more from them is nonsense. It's been proven to be the worst, worst management effective. And children don't need it. But we've all been punished. If I suffer, then you'll love me again. It's kind of like, okay, you're gonna, I'm mad at you. I'm going to punish you. And then you come out of your punishment. And now I love you again. So... <laughs> So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like we need to not love ourselves in order to get love. It's craziness. And we're seeing the craziness because now we have greater consciousness, greater wisdom to see what's inside of us. But what happens is just because we begin to feel what's inside of us, we think that what we feel is true. It's true that that's what you feel. But what you feel is based upon a faulty belief. So if a man's not motivated, we'll stay with that thing for a second. If he's not motivated to give to you, you don't feel loved. Right. So then you conclude, I'm not loved because associate, associated with that feeling is the belief that unless he's as motivated as he was in the beginning, then he doesn't love me. And that's wrong. And when you understand how men and women are different, then you don't immediately react like I'm being abandoned, I'm being rejected, I'm being abused and all that. Oh, I need to understand how to get what I need. That's called an adult, okay? Which is when you don't right. get what you want, you figure out how am I contributing to the problem? And a lot of women, they don't know how they're doing it. Just as men, they don't know how they're making it worse. It's it really, we have to, the, the, the psychology today to a great extent has pushed us all in the wrong direction. First of all, by saying men and women are the same, well, you see, most of the people who write books on relationships are counselors, you know, that we see people's relationships problems all the time. And 90% of the people who come to relationship counselors or therapists or whatever who write these books, they're women. 90% of the people come. So we have a whole jaded point of view of women expressing what they need. And you go, oh man, you know, you, you shouldn't be what you, you should be different. You know, you should be different rather than you are different. Now you have to understand what she needs because you don't know. And you as a woman need to understand what he needs. But people don't know that. They don't understand how men and women are different. We have different primary needs. So I'm glad we hit the point about not feeling appreciated. When you're not feeling appreciated, you're on your male side and you don't feel supported on your male side. But getting that support on your male side will not work because it just pushes you further into your male side. Your unhappiness comes from not respecting yourself first, but then also asking for support and getting it, changing your communication style. So people will, men will respond to you in a way that will work better. So if a woman is not feeling that respect and she's, and she might call it unappreciated, but we're really talking about respect. Yeah, we know underneath it is she doesn't feel respected. Then, and, and this has become a pattern in a relationship there's a couple of things that could be going on. A, she could have gotten into her male energy and be overgiving. And B, she, she probably is not recognizing or, or knowing how to ask for what she wants or needs. Like when I was cleaning the house, I didn't ask. I just thought he's going to see this and he's going to come clean with me. And, and, you know, I want to extend that. I wrote a book on Mars Venus in the workplace. And one of the chapters in there, one of the themes is about how to get raises, how to get recognition and how to get appreciation because that workplace money is appreciation. Right. So that's the male side. And one of the problems for women quite often is they have this belief. If I just work really, really hard and do a better job than everybody else, I'll get a raise. And I'm over here as a, as a, a boss who has a company and I've got somebody over here, whether it be a man or a woman, and they seem to be very happy with the job. And I'm totally happy with the job. I don't have to pay them that much. And they do such a great job and they're happy with the job. I'm like, great. Why am I going to offer more money? It just means more money for me. So when that woman then says to me, I just want to have a conversation with you. And she says, I want you to know that in the beginning, I was able to do this and this and I got paid this. And then now I'm able to do this. I'm doing this. I'm saving the money here and I've accomplished this and I'll show you my achievements. So 
I think a raise is very appropriate. And what I would like is this. And then if you get a no, then you, then you basically go, you don't get upset and feel betrayed because who wants to hire somebody who feels betrayed by you? Then you say, well, what will it take for me to move towards that goal that I have? Give them a chance to say what it would take. So you basically, it's all negotiation skills. The same things in the workplace, we have to have better negotiating skills, but at home, we need negotiating skills. And often we think this naive thought that if you love me, I don't have to negotiate. No, no, right. this is part of life is weighing the pros and cons of every situation. You know, why do we do it your way when I want to do it another way? Well, when it comes to romance, she's prime, she's prime. And when she gets the, the emotional support to raise her estrogen, then you can shift gears in your negotiation to, okay, how important is this to you? How important is this to me? And you just happily go with whoever it's most important to. But when there's negative emotions involved on either side, you can't negotiate. Everything will be wrong. You'll, nobody wins. When you have positive feelings and you're able to hear the other person's point of view, your point of view, and then they say, well, okay, I see this is more important to you, so I'm going to make this change for you. Then you get credit for it, you see, as opposed to you're right, and therefore I should do it your way. No, you. this is what would work for you. This is what works for me. But I'm happy to do this because I love you so much. Then it's sweet. See, it's it's not like you should. We want to take the shoulds out and just look at what works, what doesn't work. Right. Yeah, should. That kind of is a, a word if we're thinking he should or she should be doing it this way. That might be a clue right there, that word. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a telling point. And another telling point is just simply blame. Men blame women for not being happy. Women blame men for not being attentive, not being supportive, ignoring, neglect. You see, these are just automatic reactions from our male and female sides. And, and if a woman says, no, I'm more like the man, then you are more like the man. And therefore, your job, if you want to be happy and get more in life, is how to get back to your female and then start practicing the skills of increasing feminine energy inside of you, which is missing today, as well as for men to practice the skills of increasing their masculine energy. It's just gone now. The testosterone levels in men are 20% lower than 20 years ago. 20% lower. Um, that's and incredible. It's, a, and it's scary. a devastation. And it was already low then, okay? And now, whatever your age group is, there's averages for every age group. It's always going down for men. and But now, at every age group, like it used to go up to 35, and then it would start going down. Now at 22, it's 1% less than when you were at 21. It's just going down all the time after you hit puberty. <laughs> it's, it's crazy what's happening here. Men are losing their masculinity and women are losing their femininity. And it's hard to feel feminine when you have a weak man. It's hard for it a man is. to be powerful if the woman is not capable of needing his help and appreciating his help because we thrive on appreciation. Is this is this decrease in testosterone that you're describing here, John? Is this because we've been, as a society, for a period of time, we've been kind of taught that men and women are the same. There's not really any differences, and kind of the changing roles in terms of more women out there in the workforce and competing with men or even excelling over men. What's the cause for that? Well, as with anything significant, there's many, many conditions and causes. But I would, if I could, from my experience, I would say the number one cause is the shifting of roles. Mm -hmm. You see, for thousands of years, we have to look at history. Although the past has many dysfunctions in it, it got us to where we are now. So what cultures did all the way back to when I go into the jungles and, and study, you know, I lived in Ashwar Indians in, in the rainforest, go there, go to Africa, see families there. What you see is more ancient ways of living. And what yeah. you don't see is the hostility between men and women. You don't see that at all. Okay. You see bonding that happens. They don't, they, they don't have the romance that we want, but at the same time, they don't have the discord. And you go back to Romeo and Juliet. Women are often saying, you know, why aren't men romantic? What happened? They never were. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, they killed themselves. They died a day after they got married. They would have been like everybody else. You lose the passion. The romance goes away. It's called the honeymoon period, whether it's three years, seven years, now three dates. You know, <laughs> it, it, it goes away because familiarity sets in. And now your testosterone doesn't get produced as much. You need more dopamine, newness to stimulate the testosterone if you're a weak male. If, 
if you're in touch with your masculinity without depending on a woman, then a woman makes you feel more masculine if she appreciates you. She brings you from happy to happier. A man can take a happy woman to ecstasy. She can't do it herself. You need the opposite sex, period. That's my wisdom. That's my perspective of the world because it's through somebody else that you find the peace within you. By loving a man, you begin to love the masculine in you and you're also feminine at the same time. By, by loving the woman, treating her with such respect, such adoration, such caring, I'm understanding her side, I'm relating to her side. And if I can relate to it, that means I'm experiencing her in me. And I'm also this man, okay? I haven't given up my masculinity at all. That's how I became so balanced in terms of integrating. That's how I understand all these differences between men and women to a great extent. I had eight hours a day, women talking about their problems and none of them were the problems I experienced or any of my male friends. Their complaints were different from men's. It's as simple as that. <laughs> So mm -hmm. let's analyze what, what their unhappiness comes from. And that's, that's not been figured out today. So you ask what's causing it. All this history is a culture that told men you had to provide for women. And women didn't pick a man unless he mastered the skills, the self-mastery to provide for a woman. That pumped his testosterone up. See, competence. I have to prove to a woman, I have to find a woman who feels safe with me, who feels I can take care of her as she has a baby, she's raising children. You know, when you're in the Ashwar Indians in South America, most of the women were holding babies and pregnant, okay? This is what they do. You know, they'd have birth control and they're all free. <laughs> they don't have TV to distract them from having sex. So they're right. making babies all the time. So when you have babies, you need a man to go into the jungle. You need a man to get in there and do the dirty, dangerous, difficult stuff. That's called a role mate relationship. We men have a role as men. We don't do female things. And if women do the gardening, the cooking, the cleaning, the raising the kids, and they're happy with that. And if a man tries to help them, they, they, they spit at him. They're disgusted with him. Get out of the garden. Don't cook the food. Mm, really? <laughs> yes, yes. And the same thing happens today with women. When men go to their female side and start complaining, you just become disgusted with him. He's right. Like, you know, you need a guy who's strong like a tree. The wind blows and he's anchored into that. That's masculinity. There's actual, there's these talks on the internet from university professors saying, oh, poor men, they have to be so tough. They have to do difficult. They have to be grounded. They can't be reactive. They don't share their emotions. I said, what a turnoff you are. You're absolutely disgusting to my female side. It's just, Phew. so this is what happens when men are too feminine. So women cannot be turned on to them. Or in the beginning, it can happen. There's always exceptions to then work around. Many women who are way on their male side will be attracted to a weak male, to a feminized man. Why? Because that female is what he, she wants to connect with. Okay, it's through relating with someone, you get to go to the side of you, which is like them. So you like her or she likes him. So he has these feminine qualities. Maybe he always is romantic. He likes flowers. He, he dresses up. He's very considerate. He's very sensitive. Then that's all exciting until you have sex. And once you have sex, it's because she felt safe enough to go to her female receptive side. And now she's on her female side. He's on his female side. And if you know anything about magnetism, a negative polarity plus a negative polarity creates repulsion. Right. You get close and then suddenly it's like, ah, well, that's what's happening today in role reversal. Women are more masculine and men are more feminine. And so we get close. Once we get close a few times now, it's like, eh, we start seeing all the problems in a relationship. We don't want to get close. Our mind focuses on anything to justify not getting close to that person. That's when your mind is remembering his mistakes. That's when he's remembering her mistakes. You see, instead of being present time, let it go, move forward, learn your lessons. And you can't do that without this knowledge. You have to realize in every upset in a relationship, if you can't see yourself as an equal partner in the problem, you won't forgive and the problem will just get worse because you're not going to change. You want equality? If you have problems, you're an equal pro part of the problem. And if you don't know what you are, you can read this book or you can pay, pay me, spend an hour and I'll tell you everything you're doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> if I don't do that, you can't change and create a different reality. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we're looking outward and saying he's the one that needs to change, it's all his fault. He's going to, first of all, probably feel that that's what you're thinking. You might even have said it to him. It, you, you know, he'll feel it more if you don't say it. 
Oh, he'll say it. He'll, he'll then hear there's it. nothing for him to even defend against. You see, women think they're so good because they hate their partners. They're mad at their partners. They feel uh, disappointed by their partners. They question whether I want to be with my partner, but they don't tell them. So they think it doesn't count. No, it counts more because there's nothing he can do to even fix the problem and solve it, or at least defend himself from that negativity thrown at him. And, and he can say, feel it. He can feel it even if she's yes, not saying yes, it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. See, negative negativity in a woman, negativity in a man is high estrogen and low testosterone. Negativity in a woman is estrogen trying to go up, but she's too far on her male side. She's using logic and reason to justify being an unhappy, unloving person. Okay. That's every woman comes to me with 10, 15 complaints. I got, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. And you're creating the problem just as he's creating the problem. Equal up, equality and who's responsible <laughs> for the problems will save relationships. But how can I say that to somebody until I first teach them about how, what men need, what women need, and she can understand, gee, if you're upset with me and I make you wrong for being upset, I say, oh, you shouldn't be upset. Well, that's wrong. Well, you're being so selfish. How could you say that? You know, you're never happy anymore. Gosh, I've done all this stuff for you and you just don't appreciate me at all. Imagine a man saying that to you. It just shuts you down. It just yeah. shuts you down. Well, when you do that to a man, it shuts him down. <laughs> just, we need to learn how to love and we need to learn how to ask for more with love. We need to smile more. We need to take off the mask and smile more. And I think this whole thing about the mask is such a metaphor because we all have this pretense that we're right, that we're right, we're right. That's the mask we wear. Now we're taking it off, but at least realizing that the authority is wrong. Because that's the ultimate belief system that we have to let go of is the authority is our parents. The authority is the people who know better than me. And that we take in all of their negative messages that they're storing inside of them. And even the parent who doesn't say it, if they're feeling it, it still affects the child even more. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really key. That's really important. So it is it's important because I'll summarize that one. A woman was sharing with me who always very, very good Christian woman. And she loves her partner, stays with her partner. And, 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 and then I had, she had to be privately, I had to say, but when he doesn't do this, doesn't he do, how do you feel? Well, you know, I give him more, I give him more. <laughs> Just, how do you mm. feel? Don't you like feel, gee, he's not doing as much for me. And she kind of like for the first time she goes, yeah, I, I resent him. Yeah. You're not, you're angry about, it. well, I can't say that. <laughs> it's just like, you have to wake up to the darkness within yourself, not act on it, not justify it, but experience, but become aware of how you justify it and then hide it as if it doesn't count. Of course it counts. It counts oh, yeah. So key. So key. Yeah. Yeah. So for a woman that is in a relationship and I want to pursue this just a touch more because I think this is so relevant here for so many people, whether she's in a dating relationship or a long-term relationship or marriage, and they've gotten into this pattern and there's this resentment or this um, yeah, lack of I respect. Well. Um, how does a woman begin to, if she's going to say, okay, I'm part of the problem. I'm, 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 I'm going to be a problem. I'm going to own this problem. How does she begin to shift that? Does she shift it by becoming more aware of her needs and asking him to do more, asking for specific things, because she's now trained him to do less. How does, yeah. she, how does she begin to shift that energy? Okay, well, you said something very magical just then. She already knows she has to do less. Therefore, she can begin to realize that she is creating the problem from her side. Mm -hmm. She trained him that way. So that's very important. And, and, and that's one insight, but there's so many insights to realize all the mistakes you make thinking you're doing the right thing thinking you're doing the right. Every time you think, why does he do that for me? Why did, like you said, why is he offering his help? <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, because he's a man and men don't do anything unless they're paid for it, unless they're asked to do it. And it's part of their job description. That's what we do. And that's yeah, I say, are. I call it energy efficient. Yeah. Yeah. I do too. I say it's a gene that we have, which is, we call it the efficiency gene. <laughs> Never do anything you don't have to do. Women call it laziness. No. Right. No, it's just like, it's like a woman I was counseling the other day. And she said, my husband is, he works so hard. He trains people in the office to work hard, to be responsible, to do the right thing, but also take care of themselves and all these things. But then he comes home and he's exhausted and tired and he spends hours just watching TV and overeating, you know? And so, 
you know, she she basically is judging her husband. First, she tells me how much she loves him because he's such a great guy. And then she tells me all her problems. And I said, how do you fix this? Well, you fix this is you basically have to be a bigger problem that he can solve. The reason his work gets all his attention is because there's problems that he knows how to solve. You have to be a bigger problem that he can solve. And he has to be able to solve it without being the problem. You're the problem and you have a problem that he can help you with. See, this is all. How do you know you're the problem? Because you don't know how you're contributing to the problem with him. So let's say that you complained about it. Well, first of all, we're saying ask for more. Well, most women, when we say ask for more, they're going to complain. And I'm saying never complain. Don't complain. How, how do you get more from him if you don't complain? You share yourself and you make requests when he feels successful. And those requests are not demands. That means I don't need a demand is a request which says, unless you do this, I won't be happy. Unless you mm. change, I won't be happy. Mm -hmm. I can't be happy if you continue with this behavior. That's a false belief. Of course, you can be happy with whatever their behavior is. And let's say it's a really destructive behavior. Then the, the thing you need to do is learn how to be happy without him. Separate until he learned his lesson. You have to set boundaries. But you have to find out that you can be happy. And most women, you know, unless the guy's beating you up and, you know, all these terrible things, a drug addict, that's another thing. That's another category we're not talking about. But if you're not getting what you need from him, you have to first realize, and you're blaming him. That's that resentment start coming up. He's not doing this and I'm doing this. As soon as you start comparing how much I give versus him, that's a sign you're ruining the relationship right now. You can mm. say, oh, he's ruining it too. He is, but you're ruining. Equal, equal opportunity here to change the relationship. So I need to shift gears and do things that will stimulate estrogen in my body. And my body will now go into balance. Because whenever you're thinking about changing him, that's solving a problem. You're producing testosterone. Your estrogen Masculine. doesn't go up. But if you say to him, another technique that we talk about, which is, honey, I'm so stressed out at work. This happened. This happened. I just want to share my feelings about it for 10 minutes. Would you listen and say nothing? Then give me a big hug. And then tell me that you do so much. It's a great phrase I teach men to say. You do so much for so many people. Just mm -hmm. let me give you a hug. See, that's you know, no just fault. just you saying that right now made me feel so good. <laughs> it does. And you can say it again and again, just like you can smile again and again. Nobody gets tired of a smile. That's what all men need is a smile. You know, the smile says, I accept you. I'm happy to see you. I delight in your presence. Oh, my God. That just knocks your testosterone up. And a man smiles. That's an activity that will help raise her up unless she's not smiling. You don't smile when she's not smiling. You mirror that. <laughs> don't okay. smile when Tell me she's more. not smiling. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's different. I could be in a bad mood. And if you smile, it puts me in a good mood. That's a male-female thing. Whereas if she's not in a bad mood, and I just smile and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I had such a great day today. You know, I got to do this and this and this. You know, too bad for you. <laughs> it does not work. But you right. can say to me, oh, too bad for you. You don't have to say that. But you just say, oh, I see you had a hard day today. I'm so lucky that I didn't. I feel so great. And I'm so grateful to you because you helped me have a good life. That's because we have a, a bit of a traditional role mate relationship where I'm the major provider. As soon as you are the major provider, women, you're handicapped, but you can get a wheelchair and you can solve that. And you ask me, how can they deal with it? You start asking for a particular kind of support from men that helps you feel more feminine. That's the whole key to it. Even when you're asking, you're actually on your testosterone side a little bit. You're already there anyway. So take responsibility to use him to come back to your female side. And communication is a key thing. Planning dates is a key thing. Asking for help is a key thing. Depending on him for things that he can provide, as opposed to being needy, is depending on him for what he's not able to provide at this time. Mm -hmm. Everything builds, okay? If you're getting nothing, you start with getting a little and appreciating that. And then you get a little more and you appreciate that. You build up him as he builds up your ability to feel more safe and loved and you produce more of the female hormones. Yeah, beautiful. And I know in your book, you also share additional ideas for, you know, for, for women that are have been kind of operating in the masculine on how to kind of get back into that 
feminine energy and to begin to, I know your daughter, Lauren, has the, has the course Me Time, how to give yourself some me time and some deep self-care and to meet some of those feminine needs and, and take that time for yourself. That's something you can also begin to do right away. Yes, it's such an amazing course. We'll raise your estrogen as taking it, but then teach you how to keep making it. Uh, it's a six-week class for women only, and it's amazing. It's just, it helps so many people. Of all of my things, I get the most rave reviews. We get the most rave reviews on the Me Time course. But mm. we're going to have a new one coming up soon, which is called Understanding Men. That's going to, four-week course. It's rave reviews. And then another one, which is, how to be most attractive to the opposite sex. I'm working on that one. And that's mm, lovely. Up. And you see the difference of taking a course and hearing me talk right now is when we create courses, we have summary statements. We have frequently asked questions. We have uh, exercises that you do. And that's probably the most important thing. And with all the exercises, we do the exercise first for you to give you a, a vision of how it looks, to actually make a change, how to process yourself, how to look at yourself, look at your unreal, you know, unrealistic expectations. And then we even have quizzes that are really fun. We sit for hours creating these quizzes. They're so funny because <laughs> in a quiz, you have to write three wrong answers and one right answer and then have to pick. <laughs> it's like very fun. Yeah, that's great. And we'll be excited about um, hearing more about that as you roll those out. And I'd be very honored to help uh, spread the word to the audi to my audience and everything too, John. Well, Michelle, I really appreciate your work. You're doing such a great job in your own work, as well as sharing what I have to bring to the world. I appreciate that a lot. And we also, one thing I forgot to mention is at marsvenus.com slash gift. Everybody can get a free course. There's a free course there on getting everything you want in relationships, which doesn't mean that you're going to get it right away. It means you're going to become <laughs> aware of 15 things you've been doing wrong. <laughs> this is what women tell me. Oh, my God, I didn't know. Oh, my God, I didn't know. Oh, my God, I didn't know. Then comes the process of putting it into action, which can be scary because it's a whole other way of interacting. Yeah. Well, and you know what, John? Um, I just You just reminded me I wanted to share one little comment from our last interview that we did, um, a woman wrote, she said, it's never too, it's never too late to date and find love, but boy, I wish I had read Dr. Gray's books in my twenties. She said, I would have had men wrapped around my little finger and had a ton of proposals. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's amazing. I, I wish I knew this stuff when I was in high school, <laughs> I would have been the, the peacock, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I wish I would have known too. It would have saved me some uh, dating disasters along the way. But I really think one of the cool things about the kind of work you're doing and that I'm blessed to do is that there's always more to learn and discover about this. Like no matter yeah. how much we know. And, and so I think that's also a message to the audience here. It's like, this is a journey. This is not like, okay, I've got it all down and, and I've arrived at the destination and I've got everything all together. This is a journey. I mean, yes, you and, study and relationships for decades and have produced this huge body of work. And I went through all the ups and downs of all the dating. I used to say I was going to write a book called Dating for Decades, chronicling all my yeah. misadventures. Great, set, great title. You should write that book. <laughs> yeah. And now have been married for 15 years. So I've learned, you know, from both sides of the equation, but even studying this day in and day out and learning from wonderful people like you, John, I'm just amazed at like how, how much there is to learn and how much there still is to discover about ourselves and human relationships. It's one of the things that is really fascinating about this kind of work. So I just am saying it's a journey for people yeah. out there. Yeah. It is a journey, but the great thing about it, every time you make one positive change, there's a fulfillment that comes into your life. And then there's the next obstacle and you have to overcome that one. But you don't have to get to the end of the road. And women have this, re this wisdom more so than men. Men think they postpone their happiness until they achieve their goal. Instead of realizing every experiencing every step towards that goal is very fulfilling. But it's in a relationship where you know, this is the meaningful part of us, the heartfelt part of us is, is a relationship. And we can make a change in a relationship. We, it's just, it, it's fulfillment. You don't have to have the perfect relationship. You just have to overcome that obstacle. And then you move to the next one and the next one. And they, they keep coming up. You know, my wife has passed on. I'm in another relation, relationship now. And I get to learn. I, I learned so many lessons. I'm always learning lessons. It's really fun. And, but 
it's so easy once you get the basics down, once you get the basics down, it's it's discovering another person and all of their intricacies and everything that's inside. And just knowing that no matter what comes out of her, <laughs> I can be loving, you know, not taking things personally, but realizing what her needs are, fulfill those needs. And then she comes back to feeling this optimistic part of her, positive part of her. But the intimacy can still be so deep because we went into the darkness, so to speak. And then you bring in the light and it's lasting. And then you go to the next step. It's a journey. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is these topics are timeless because I think love and relationships are always going to be important as part of our, our human needs and desires for most people to, to have a great relationship. So it's, it's always wonderful to be able to feature your work, John, and I'm so grateful for your contribution. And I, I really, really appreciate um, the opportunity to connect with you and your contribution to my work and my events. It means a lot. The, the ladies love you. And every time I interview you, they all say, we want more of John, interview John some more. And they all send me all kinds of questions and comments. And so I know it's making a difference. I know a lot, it's reaching a lot of people and I'm really yes. grateful for that opportunity to partner with you in this way. Thank you. You're very welcome, Michelle. And everybody, we're going to put the links to John's um, site and everything um, below the video in the descriptions. And so be sure to check out his resources. And uh, if you haven't picked it up already, be sure to pick up Mars and Venus, Beyond yeah, Mars and Venus. Beyond Mars and Venus. And there's an eight hour audio of me reading the book as well. And it's oh, kind of great. Go, oh, it's you talking. Nobody else reading the book. And it's eight yeah, hours. That's wonderful because so. so many people enjoy listening to audiobooks, traveling, yeah. and other things. And yeah. so that's great. So thanks for mentioning that. Thanks again, John. Lovely to connect with you again. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye for now. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. Bye bye now.